Thank you. Um, if we have more people filtering in here um, after the break that they had, I wanted to welcome our, our next session. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Paul Harmitz from Children's Hospital of Oakland. Um, Dr. Harmitz spoke earlier um, in our session yesterday, but he is the Director of Pediatric Clinical Research at the Center of UCSF, and he's going to talk to us about updates regarding alpha manacidosis. Hello, Al. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope I can make up some time. I'll move very quickly through this talk. The, the thing to highlight, um, you know, this is not a mucopolysaccharide or ML disease, but it is a related disease. And what I want you to focus on are the difficulties it had getting approval based on the first clinical trials and even the phase three trial and the uh, ability of the, the sponsor that was taking PAC who was taking care of um, uh, moving this drug to approval, did post hoc analyses, were able to, to demonstrate effectiveness in post hoc analyses and then um, uh, convince the European uh, EMA to approve the drug. So it's, it's just an example of how um, we have to tackle these extremely rare diseases and apply some of the principles that Lauren Clark went through with you earlier. So these are my disclosures. This is a, a lysosomal storage disease. It's similar to our MPS diseases. There is an enzyme that is not working and the material that it fails to digest is an oligosaccharide. So you change the type of substrate, but you have a pretty similar mechanism uh, to what uh, we're dealing with with MPS diseases. And the oligosaccharides accumulate in the cell. They have a similar uh, uh, mechanism uh, by which they injure the cell and the tissue. And many of the if you look at the picture of these patients, they're very similar to uh, what we see with MPS disease. We have a, uh, skeletal abnormalities, we have pulmonary, cardiac, coarse facies, hydrocephalus can develop. Um, they have some differences. Hearing loss is, is pretty sig well described, common in these patients, and they also have an immune deficiency. They lower their IgG antibody, so they have trouble fight, fighting infections. So, uh, but otherwise, they, they can look very similar to MPS and, and almost fit the picture of MPS-7. Um, we, like our other MPS, there is a very wide spectrum of disease from uh, very slowly progressing to, to severe uh, life-threatening in the uh, infancy, early childhood period. And, short survival, so a wide spectrum of disease. Uh, disease at the severe end is much more likely to affect the neurologic function, and um, uh, you're all familiar with this story with MPS. So designing trials when you have very few patients like MPS-7, um, which is probably the approximate frequency of this disease, is trying to find um, some way to, to examine the, the group of patients and show that the drug is having an effect, but you can't do it with a single outcome. So um, this, the drug that is approved now in Europe is called Valmanase Alpha. It has a, about a 15-year story. It started in an academic center in, in Copenhagen, Denmark. It was funded by the uh, EU Commission in a program they have for developing drugs. It had collaborators throughout Europe. All of the patients were flown to Copenhagen for all of the trials to try to improve consistency. They were all European, and I'll describe that process. A company, a very small company called Zymanex, was initially partnered with um, the university in Copenhagen. Uh, they took the drug through phase one, phase two, and into the middle of phase three trials. And then around 
2012-2013, KIC picked up um, ownership of the drug and tried to finish phase three and take the drug to approval. And it was difficult. And it, just from this example, you'll see that you have to be resilient. You can't let, you can't give up on these trials. There's too much information embedded in the data that um, that you have to convince the regulators is relevant. So again, this enzyme works just like our other enzymes for MPS diseases. It's given IV, it's given once a week, travels to cells, uses the mannose-6-phosphate receptor, gets traffic to the lysosome, digests the material, and you see your positive benefit. Um, this slide is, is complex, but really summarized the clinical trial um, process. They started with a group of patients, 10 patients, and these were mostly pediatric patients, all pediatric patients, and they did a phase one, phase two A, two B, and then now we have long-term follow-up on these nine patients, and things look very promising with the phase 2A, 2B, and the three-minute stair climb, which you're familiar with from MPS trials, MPS 6, MPS 4A used a three-minute stair climb. They actually found it looked better than the six-minute walk test and chose that as a primary outcome. Then they moved to a phase 3, and now they, they brought up 15 actively treated patients, 10 placebo, it was randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. Um, it was a uh, one-year trial. It was a mix of about 15 pediatric and 10 adult patients, so it had both age groups. And this immediately through this heterogeneity, the adults have a different disease spectrum from the pediatric patients, and they have a different, uh, they're going to respond in different areas. Um, uh, for instance, pain compared to the pediatric patients. The pediatric patients are likely to, to improve their walk test or their stair climb uh, with a bigger response. So now you've added a lot of heterogeneity by broadening your age range. So a one-year trial occurred. The phase three treated patients went into long-term treatment. The phase three placebo went on to active drug. So everybody was on treatment. And I'll show you the, the analysis um, in the next slide that was attempting to, by classic analysis, um, uh, prove to the regulators that this drug was working. So, um, oops. So they, it had a co-primary outcome. One was the biochemical outcome, the serum oligosaccharides. The other is the three-minute stair climb. So you have a functional. The regulators have still resisted using a biomarker as, our, as a primary outcome, even with the extremely rare diseases. And, um, but the oligosaccharides, this is your placebo group, has adults and pediatrics, and then this is your actively treated group, and you can see there's a very significant response from a biochemical standpoint. But you turn to your walk test, your stair climb, and it was true of the walk test, which was also included, but the primary, co-primary outcomes were the most important. It's what you'd like to take to the regulators to get approval. The actively treated group showed a small improvement less than a step per minute, and the control placebo group had some decline. But the difference between this, these two groups was not significant. And this would be the point a company could become very discouraged, decide not to go ahead with the uh, development program and suddenly a promising therapy, which it's not exotic. It's doing, it's an enzyme. It, we think it works just like it does in MPS, and it's just reproving in a new population that, that an enzyme replacement can work. But they were at the point of, of considering stopping the study. Fortunately, there was uh, uh, some very 
sort of enthusiastic, young, creative people at KAC, very small division. This is a company that very, it's, it's in Parma, it has, it's a family owned uh, business and their primary area is surfactant for treating neonatal respiratory uh, distress syndrome and they're one of the biggest suppliers in the world of that drug is quite different and do they take a risk and keep moving ahead with this program but fortunately the company voted to move ahead and the first step was to say okay let's bring all of these patients back they've been on treatment for extended period let's do one more very controlled evaluation of the whole population so everybody um, uh, came back, you can see that 19 were less than, were in pediatrics, uh, 14 were adults, they had been treated for 12 to 48 months, they came back for a full set of evaluations and um, uh, the evaluations long term uh, showed that, that we had uh, changes uh, that were persistent, this was the oligosaccharides. If this started uh, disappearing, then you've got a drug that's effective, but then losing effectiveness. And that could happen with antibody. We've seen uh, uh, that happen with individual patients with antibody, but it looked very good in terms of, okay, this is 12 month decline. Now it's maintained up to, to four years, so long term effect looked very good. Looking at um, uh, change in mobility, and now remember you're not look, you don't have a placebo, you don't have a control group anymore, but you're, you're looking long term what has happened to their, uh, their mobility, and we're, uh, we're looking at the three minute stair climb you're seeing at the end of 12 months of treatment, it was four steps per minute improvement, you add the additional time and you're continuing to improve so and the same was even more so in the pediatric group I said that they were much more responsive which tends to be the case with these mobility tests and the adults still showed a little bit of improvement but the, you can see why adding the adults together with the pediatrics you suddenly don't get as strong a response and this is the, the heterogeneity age is one of your big uh, factors. You're desperate to find patients. They took every patient they could find at the time in Europe, 25 patients um, uh, for the phase three, 33 total. Uh, this was all they could, could muster for this disease. We saw similar results from the six minute walk test. So um, mobility again, overall we didn't see much change we saw improvement in the um, pediatric group, a little bit worsening in the adult group. Overall, actually, we saw a significant improvement, but it was, you really um, see much of it in the pediatric age range. Improvement in pain, though, in contrast, we see um, uh, the change most significant, the improvement in pain in the adult group. And this, uh, the MET, sort of a classic uh, minimal important, clinically important difference, which is to, has been defined from other diseases, and we saw that type of improvement in uh, this group. We didn't see significant improvement, even though it did improve in the um, under 18, and overall we, we did have a significant improvement. So pain was good for the older patients, stair climb was better for the younger patients immunoglobulin levels were a parameter that was measured late in the clinical trials, so it was hard to use this um, uh, as a primary outcome, but you can see that we had a, a large improvement in the treated patients in the amount of serum immunoglobulin, which helps fight infection, and you see the placebo did not change, but then improved as soon as they moved on to drugs. So future trials, this will probably be an important second biochemical parameter to put in. So I've, what I've pointed out to you with 
these clinical trials, and Dr. Lauren Clark emphasized the same problems. You have very rare patients. They're extremely different, have many different problems. It's different in each patient, and you are trying to find outcomes that, that you can present uh, to the regulators to convince them that the, the patients are responding. And what we did with, with the alpha man data was go back and look for a multivariable responder analysis. Can we group the responses in a way that now each patient, one patient might do better in a walk test, one patient does better in a stair climb, but they both can get credit even though the other uh, response was not uh, uh, identified. So uh, that was the type of analysis. It's similar to what has been used with other diseases. I'm most familiar with MPS7. You heard Dr. Clark mention MPS7, very unique design in terms of how to st start the trial. It was a blind start with 12 patients, but even more so is the, the outcome which looked at many different outcomes and they were different in every patient. And if a patient had a positive response on some outcomes, they could get credit uh, towards approval. So with this group of patients, we set up uh, three categories. One were the biochemical measures, so pharmacodynamic measure, change in the serum oligosaccharides. We looked at functional, which were the walk tests, and we looked at quality of life which was pulled off of both the pain and the disability index from the CHAC. So we had three categories, and um, we defined from the literature changes that we thought were clinically important. And then we looked at how many, we, we, grew, we looked at each patient according to these different outcomes, and um, if they, responded in two categories, they became a, had a glo global treatment response. If they responded in three categories, in other words, they have a plus for all three, that's even better. And this was the type of data we tried to show the regulators. So this was the original phase three trial that you saw had no difference in the stair climb and washed out on the classic analysis. We're looking at the placebo, the treated patients, and suddenly you, you see a very different pattern in terms of uh, this, the orange is no response, no positive responses. Um, uh, one response is green, two responses uh, blue. So you're seeing in the treated side uh, a much bigger shift to this middle, and you're actually even getting three responders in 13%. So 70% of the patients had two responses, 13% had three responses, compared to 30% with two, which is by definition a global treatment response, and no responses in the uh, three category. So on a percent basis, this gave us 30% global treatment responders, it gave us 87% in uh, the treated groups. And now suddenly we've turned what looked like absolutely no response into uh, something to, to really look at. This is long-term follow-up. Um, what we see after patients have all been treated for 12 months, we see 55% have two responses, 24% three responses, but if you follow it out to that late evaluation and the mean time was now 29 months instead of 12 months, you've had even further shift of the two response categories over to three response in 45%. So the biggest change, this drops a little because these patients are moving over to the three response category. Uh, after 12 months, 79% response. After uh, end of uh, long-term response, 88%. We did separate uh, pediatric versus adult, and what you can see is that there's a much higher percentage of p 
pediatric patients who reached two or three responses. Adults, it was 35, 35. So we had 100% global responders and a much higher three category response in pediatrics. So early, this told us, suggested early treatment and supported early treatment. Safety um, was very good in this, these trials. We had um, a small number of infusion related reactions. They were mild to moderate. Um, six patients developed antibody out of the, um, uh, the 33. Only two had high levels and those patients uh, had reactions that again were mild to moderate and were, uh, it did not cause them to have to leave the trial. So at this point, these were the data that were presented to the EMA. They were accepted. The drug is approved and the patients are now moving on to commercial therapy in Europe. But the question is how can we bring this to the United States? And, um, uh, and the plan at this point is to, to set up one, hopefully one phase three trial. It'll be small. Um, the estimate on patient numbers are in the same range as we have for the MPS-7, which was 12 patients, and hopefully this will be accepted, the design by FDA, and will start in 2019. So um, uh, we anticipate sites in Canada and the U.S. and probably multiple sites with some travel, like we've had with the other enzyme therapy trials. but. Um, uh, this is all dependent on discussions with FDA. So I hope I gave you a, a little bit of hope that you really have to, to uh, encourage companies not to stop after a large, very well-designed, aggressive trial just because the outcome is not uh, meeting a primary pre-plan, statistical plan, to try to look harder at the data, find um, a new way to analyze it, convince FDA or EMA that, that you have a significant response. It's just you're dealing with such heter heterogeneity, small populations that you have to have some flexibility and creativity in how you analyze. So I'll finish by thanking the many investigators. These are all European investigators. Uh, Alan Lund and Lee Borgwalk are the Copenhagen investigators that really led this trial. Uh, it was a European Commission uh, original funding, then Zymanex and KAC on a corporate side. So special thanks to all of these families. They flew to, to Copenhagen for infusions on a weekly basis for many years. Now they're at back to their home site, but still flying for periodic assessments. And um, it's the, it was a huge commitment. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harmitz. Our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Gray from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He asked me not to read his full, his full bio, but I wanted to let you know that um, uh, Dr. Gray's core expertise is in AAV gene therapy vector engineering, um, followed by optimizing approaches to deliver gene to the nervous system. All right, so I'm coming here uh, really as a, maybe a little bit of an outsider. I've worked with a lot of neurological diseases, um, advancing gene therapy approaches, uh, but but in this space, uh, mostly focused, you know, just on mucolipidosis uh, as kind of some early approaches to try to test out a gene therapy. Um, so I'm not coming from a company. I'm not, um, you know, I'm here as a parent, but not a parent of an affected child. Uh, but I'm right now. I'm just Steve. So, you know, I'm here really just to give you a perspective on gene therapy and what we've done, uh, you know, sort of a little bit about, you know, my story or, or you know, the, the story around um, diseases that I've been working on of trying to just, in a very grassroots way, um, develop a novel gene therapy approach and try to move it into clinical trial. So, you know, there's a million different ways to do this, um, but what I'm really coming to speak about is, uh, you know, like I said, th this is... It's really, um, you know, a story about, uh, you know, affected families, patient, patient communities, really grabbing the disease and pushing and advocating for themselves to try to move a treatment forward. 
Um, so how does gene therapy work? You know, I think that everybody, you know, ought to be somewhat familiar with this but at the end of this meeting, but, you know, um, if you, if you want, this is really an outstanding book. If you just want kind of a historical perspective on gene therapy and, um, you know, it's an interesting read. It's, it's I think, reasonably lay friendly. Um, but, you know, the idea here is obviously, you know, you've got um, a defective gene that's identified and where I'm coming from is, is basically packing a working copy of that gene into a carrier like a virus and then using this virus to um, put that gene back into the body. So conceptually, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. The gene is missing, we're gonna put it back. Of course, the devil's in the details. Um, and, you know, it's not just scientific details, it's also more of like, okay, how does this really work? Um, you know, we have this, but, you know, the steps here are first, usually, uh, we, you know, you do this, and then you have, say, a sick mouse or some other animal model, and you're trying to make the sick mouse healthy, and then that gives you a proof of concept that uh, okay, maybe we have something to be excited about. So at that point, you know, you need to talk to the FDA or other regulatory uh, agency, whatever country you're from. Um, and then they're gonna ask you to do safety studies. This is gonna be additional studies really to, uh, you know, in different animal models to say that this is really, you know, it's okay to take something that's never been injected into a human being and then put it in a vulnerable child. Um, and then you have to get permission um, after you've established safety and you have to go to, you know, the alphabet soup of regulatory agencies and this is, this is an involved process. Um, and then ultimately, you know, you're, you're gonna try to test it in a patient. And, you know, we're not, we're hoping that it's a treatment, but this is, when you get here, this is an experiment, okay? Um, now, you know, the, the one thing that I've left out of here is, <laughs> the reason why most of this takes a long time and the reason why uh, we talk about natural history studies and biomarkers and all these other things because in order to move these things forward, you have to have money coming from somewhere. And, and in the end, the money usually comes from companies. And a company exists because they're obligated to their shareholders or their investors and they can't do this on a charity basis. So they've got to figure out a way to fund this the other way is um, why this takes so long is you might, you know, say apply for a grant and you get a grant, yay, you get a grant and then you've done this part of the study. Well then you talk to the FDA and you're excited but then you don't have any money for this. So you have to go and apply for another grant and then it might be a year before you get the money and then it's a five year project and then yay, it works. Well, okay, now I don't have money to do this and so, you know, you can see why this can take years and years and years and that's the reality of what happens. Um, what, so I'm gonna just back up a little bit and talk about sort of a story of how this happened relatively quickly um, in an effort that I uh, w was heavily involved with. And it's using this virus that we've heard about a lot in this meeting called AAV, um, adeno-associated virus. Uh, this, this is AAV, um, this is adenovirus, that's AAV. Um, it's a little small, inconspicuous virus, but um, it's basically a molecular mail truck for genes. There's about 30 odd years of research that have gone into taking this virus, scooping out its genes, and then just replacing it with whatever therapeutic gene we want it to carry. It's very safe, it's the only human virus we know that doesn't cause any disease in humans. Um, and now it's been used in over 100 clinical trials. So, so as a f medical field, we've got a good track record of this. Um, so using this virus, I kind of came in 2006 where I started training on how to use this virus. Um, I'm, I'm a basic scientist, um, but my, uh, the fork in my road came and I can, I can put it to a single point when I met, when I met this girl, Hannah, um, in 2008. And this is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I'm here today. Because uh, this put a face in front of me of a child that if we worked hard enough and we worked smart enough that maybe we could treat her. Um, and so, you know, Hannah had this disease called giant axonal neuropathy. This affects less than 100 kids in the world that we know of right now. Um, it's ultra rare, but you can see kind of the visual progression of this disease. It's ultimately fatal around 20 years old. Um, no treatments, not very much known about the biology of the disease, but we knew that these kids had what they had because they're missing this one gene called GAN. Um, so, 
conceptually, if we could replace the gene, then we could fix this disease, and that's what we went about doing. The technology didn't exist to do that, um, but Hannah's parents started this foundation called Hannah's Hope Fund, very grassroots effort, really led by a single family that, with, with support from others, and, um, and they, they, they took this disease, they grabbed the bull by the horns, and they took control of their destiny, and they moved it forward. So long and short, and this could be like a two-hour talk, I mean, talking about this whole journey, but, um, but basically, you know, the, they, they uh, funded me with the first grant that they ever gave to anybody in 2008, and by 2011, we, we had developed an approach, a new gene therapy approach to deliver a gene broadly across the brain. We, t we treated mice with this disease, we treated cells that have this disease, and, and we actually got to a point where, you know, things were not perfect, but we felt like we had something that could help these kids in three years. Uh, so we talked to the FDA at the beginning of 2012, um, and we said, hey, we want to do something that's never been done in a human being before for these kids. And they said, awesome, um, here's what you have to do. Uh, and, and they were actually really good to work with. They were very helpful, they got it, they wanted this to work, they wanted it to move forward, um, but it had to be done in a responsible way. So um, then spent a couple more years doing these things that I had no knowledge about, but uh, that, uh, that I learned along the way, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, safety, toxicology, you know, clinical trial design, all the things that I was not prepared to do, but we figured out because we had some sick kids that really needed help, and if we didn't do it, nobody else would. Um, and then, uh, so that all went actually really, really smooth. Um, it worked out really well. And then we went to this alphabet soup of regulatory agencies that we had to get approval from. Um, I think the most aptly named is the RAC. Um, but we, we made it through those. And, you know, this thing that happened that was kind of crazy that in 2015, after six and a half years, uh, we dosed the first patient. And from here to here was basically funded 100% from this small family foundation. Um, so this was a really cool day for me whenever, uh, I had never been to clinicaltrials.gov, but when I <laughs> went to it and looked, and there's our clinical trial uh, that showed up as first in human um, uh, study that, uh, and this was uh, May of 2015. Uh, we dosed a uh, 10-year-old um, girl with GAN as the first, um, first person to ever receive intrathecal, so we are injecting into the spinal fluid, um, gene transfer to broadly treat a, a brain disease for any disease. And so this happened for this disease that nobody had ever heard about, that nobody ever knew about, um, that affects less than 100 kids in the world because the, the parents pushed it and advocated and, and made miracles happen. So, <laughs> um, so just, uh, you know, just for a little bit of closure, I'll say that, you know, uh, this, is, this is Hannah a couple years ago. This is a note from her mom. Um, so she did get treated in this trial. Um, she wasn't first, but she was in it. Um, now, we, this is not a cure for GAN. This is a treatment, it is not perfect. And one of the things that scientists like to do is scientists like to have things perfect. And sometimes perfect is the enemy of the good. And sometimes we have to accept that good is good enough right now and let's move it forward and do what we can. So what's next with GAN? We've treated 11 kids. The trial is moving smoothly. Um, actually Pfizer is involved. Um, to, to potentially commercialize this. Um, and like I said, we know that what we have isn't a cure, but we're seeing pretty clear results that it is at least helping. Um, so we're evolving this treatment even while we're treating patients. And this goes back to when you talk about bench to bedside. It's not a one-way street. You go bench to bedside, you learn at bedside, you go back to bench. And that's what we're doing, and so we're evolving this, and we're trying to make the treatment better, even while we're trying to treat kids with the best that we have right now. So what's next for other rare diseases? This is a story for GAN. Um, and, and this kind of comes back to how do you tackle 7,000 rare diseases that will affect one in 10 Americans at some point in their lives? You know, MPS is a small part of that, but it's, it's your world. 
Um, and so I kind of say, well, you know, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> One bite at a time. How do you treat rare diseases? One disease at a time. We have technology to treat a lot of these diseases now, and let's start chipping away at it. And that's, that's kind of our philosophy. Um, now, the way that I'm doing that right now is with this vector that, you know, that when I say vector, a vector is like something that's moving a gene into the body. So ours is this virus called AAV9, that this is what Aviona is using, this is what Regenix is using, this is basically what everybody you've heard from during this meeting is using. Um, and, and the reason why we're using that is because we kind of view this as a platform treatment. It can deliver genes to the brain pretty well. Um, and, and we can put different genes to treat different diseases. So this is a, this is a cool day for me in the lab uh, when I was working and we were trying different AAVs to see if any of them cross a blood-brain blood barrier. Um, and, uh, and the way that we do this, we inject mice intravenously and then you wait a few weeks and then you kill the mouse and then you, you section its brain and then you stain it to see if your gene got there. And, and I was doing this and, and you know, this is when I was kind of working on the bench and, um, and all of a sudden all the slides turned black. Uh, um, and black means that the gene got there. And I was like, well, okay, what went wrong? <laughs> um, but sure enough, looked under the microscope and, and wow, like all of this dark stain here is where the gene is getting into the brain. Um, and this was, this was a light bulb moment for me that's like, all right, maybe we actually have something that can work and, and this, can, this can move forward. Um, so the cool thing about being a scientist is then I get to run across the hall and grab whoever I can find and say, hey, you want to be the second person in the world to ever see this? Um, so, you know, but we were looking at injecting IV, and as it turns out, you need, you need a crap ton of virus um, to inject IV. Uh, and, and there were some other reasons why we started looking at, you know, what are ways we can concentrate this around the brain, and we moved to doing, basically injecting into the spinal fluid, so we do spinal taps in mice, um, it's as hard as it sounds, but we've gotten good at it. And, um, and then so, you know, again, all the, all the dark here is where you're seeing the gene going into the brain. Um, and it goes to the spinal cord really well uh, also. Um, so this is, this is, you know, something that we've published on it in mice. We've published on it in monkeys. Um, we've done this in pigs. We've done this in dogs. We've done, you know, um, moving forward. And it seems like it's something that works pretty well. We've applied it to different diseases. This is, th and these are just coming out of my lab. If you go out beyond my lab, there's like 10 times as many publications. So this is Rett syndrome, crab -A disease, giant axon neuropathy, Tay-Sachs disease, Sandhoff disease, right? You know, so it's, it's really kind of a platform approach. And just to put this in perspective, with AEV9, these are all the trials that I know about, and this is a growing list, that are using this AAV9 as a, as a way to deliver genes. So you have spinal muscular atrophy that is just, I mean, miraculous results that have been reported. Our GAN trial, MPS3A and B, MPS1 and 2, you know, so this is, this is moving along. Um, now this is uh, kind of what, what my lab is focused on and the diseases that are just in, in our wheelhouse um, where you know, companies kind of show their drug development pipeline. I guess this is my lab's drug development pipeline. <laughs> but um, we have GAN that's in a clinical trial. These are all things where we've talked to the FDA. We have a clear path to move it into a clinical trial, and we're hoping to start these next year. Um, and then these are like CLN5 batten. We've treated sheep with this disease and halted the progression. Um, this is something we're trying to move forward as well. So. It really is kind of a platform approach. It's not one size fits all, but this is something that is kind of bringing a lot of hope to, to different rare diseases. So, um, let me take a step back, say, what are the magic ingredients? How does this happen? And I would say, you know, my advice from my perspective um, is the most important thing is to link scientists and families, and this is what this meeting does. Um, you have to have compassion. You also have to have know-how. Wanting it to happen bad enough doesn't just make it happen. Um, also, I'll say accountability. 
hold your doctors accountable, hold your scientists accountable, make sure that they're focused on what they should be focused on. Um, and I mean, I hate to say it, but I, I, you know, I can't say enough, like money has to come from somewhere. Um, whether it's fundraising for a company, whether it's fundraising for a foundation, you know, this stuff's expensive. Um, so, you know, a highlight here, and this is just something that I've been kind of breaking down when we're looking at kind of pipeline approaches to treating rare diseases, you know, what does this really cost? Um, and uh, different people put different numbers out, but this is kind of historically what, what it's looked like for us. You know, when you're talking proof of concept preclinical, this means treating mice, treating different models in the lab just to say, does this work? And then you have toxicology studies. Is it safe? This gets more expensive. Um, manufacturing right now for gene therapy is a mess. And it is, it is a seller's market. Um, and companies can kind of charge whatever they want because there's 100 people that want stuff made for one manufacturing facility. Um, and then clinical trials cost money too. So you can see uh, in my world, this is one of the biggest barriers. It's not, it's not always a science. A lot of times it's not the science. It's, you know, the money and time. So what now? Uh, you know, I'll get philosophical here a little bit. Um, say the Orphan Drug Act was passed in 1983, and to accelerate development of, dr of drugs affecting less than 200,000 people in the U.S. Can you imagine if you had 200,000 patients for your disease, how much attention you'd get? Like, that's a joke. I, I deal with things that affect less than 1,000 people, things that affect less than 100 people, and, and we're, we're moving them forward into tr clinical trials. Um, so, but the, the problem is big, because again, you've got over 7,000 rare diseases that have been officially recognized. Over 6,000 still don't have any approved treatment at all. Um, so, you know, what is the model for getting effective treatments to patients for diseases affecting 10,000 people, 1,000 people, 100 people? We talk about precision medicine. We talk about personalized medicine. But there's not really a good way to make that happen. It's, it's nice buzzwords, but government and regulatory agencies haven't figured that out. But they are thinking about it. They're trying to figure it out. It's just, it's tough. So, you know, I'll kind of leave you again with this. Um, you know, you're, you're part of this. Your community's part of this. I'm part of this. Uh, and the best that I know to do, again, is just, just chip away one disease at a time until, until we get to the end. And if we have enough people working on it and enough people pushing it, then that number is going to get smaller and smaller until, until we've actually done something about this. Um, so with that, I, I thank you a lot for your time. I'm not going to go, um, I think I'm not going over. This is awesome. And, uh, but I'll be around if you need. <laughs> if, if you want to go into the weeds, then grab me. I'm happy to talk. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Our next speaker is Kendra Borker, who spoke earlier on complex care management, and she's going to speak to us um, this morning about understanding the pain and anxiety, depression, and chronic conditions of MPS and related diseases.